I'm Lori Schneider. I'm with the Pollinator Friendly Alliance. The Alliance works in Minnesota communities, cities, and counties advocating for a healthy environment for pollinators and people too. One city at a time, we celebrate those communities that pass pollinator protection resolutions, an important step for pollinator habitat. The Minneapolis City Council passed such a resolution in 2015 thanks to the encouragement of Mayor Betsy Hodges. Betsy Hodges represented Ward 13 on the Minneapolis City Council since 2006 and went on to become Mayor of Minneapolis in 2014. She's also um, taken the pledge with the National Wildlife Federation Monarch Pledge. So join me in applauding uh, pollinator champion, Mayor Betsy Hodges. Well, hello, everybody. It is great to be in a room full of fr pollinator friendly people. That doesn't happen as often as you'd think, that you know that it's happening. Uh, so the first thing I'd like to say is welcome to the city of Minneapolis. If you are not already from here, I'm very, very glad that you are here. Um, one of the things that, um, one of the things I don't know that I've even talked about in this setting is that my mother's third career, uh, she was a physical therapist and then a writer, my mother's third career was president of an organic fertilizer company. And you have not lived until you've been at a Hodges family meal where my mother is talking about the incredible importance of, um, you know, if you use fertilizer, organic fertilizer correctly, and you and you and you, that supports the growth of the plants that you want, and it retards the growth of the plants that you don't want, and then you don't need to use all these pesticides, and that has a great impact on a whole bunch of things, uh, our waterways, our entire climate, including our pollinators. Welcome to dinner at the Hodges household. So I know that you all know why it's incredibly important. I know that you all know why taking care of our pollinators, taking care of bees and monarchs and other pollinators at the very basic level uh, is an incredibly basic and important thing we need to do for the health and survival of our species and our entire planet. It is no less than that, right? I mean, that's why you're all here. That's why we're all here. But I also know that it has implications, you know, thinking about something at this granular level, thinking about how important it is to take care of what many would consider the least among us, although we know better, at some point actually changes your entire worldview. And you start thinking of the entire planet differently if you prioritize making sure that bees are doing okay. You think about the entire world differently. Because then you know that, that doing that makes sure that you are thinking about your environment is okay and that our kids are okay and that our ability to eat is okay and our ability to eat and our need for water and shelter and medical care like four fundamental things about us as human beings. So the fact that, you're, that we're here today organizing around what would be many consider uh, the least among us is a testament to understanding that really there is no least among us. And that if we set up our organizations, if we set up our policy to reflect that reality, then we are living in a world where everybody is respected and everybody comes together and everybody is considered important, which is what we are all after. And that all starts with bees and butterflies. That's pretty cool, right? So in Minneapolis in 2015 in August, we passed a resolution which commits Minneapolis to increasing bee-friendly plants in the city and decreasing pesticide use. Both of those things are important to replenish our pollinator population. Thank you. And it also declares that we are a pollinator-friendly community and encourages residents and businesses themselves to adopt pollinator-friendly practices, such as habitats for bees and avoiding pesticides that are known to kill them. Um, the conversation about avoiding pesticides that we don't know yet if they kill them is also a good conversation to have. 
And we also commit to improving policies and practices to increase pollinator forage and decrease pesticide use in addition to urging Minneapolis property owners and residents and businesses, everybody. We're basically saying to everybody, let's think about this and if we do this right, we're gonna be thinking about our entire community right. We're gonna be thinking about our entire community forward. And we can't talk about the impact of pollinators without talking about the impact of climate change. We are at a time when it is a question for some whether or not it's actually happening. So I'll just be clear, it's happening. Science matters. Science matters. <laughs> Uh, I had the chance a couple years ago to, this is a funny thing to say, I had a chance a couple years ago to meet with the Pope at the Vatican, which is true. He invited 60 mayors from around the world to come meet with him to talk about two things that he sees as the most cru cru crucial issues facing humanity, climate change and human trafficking. And he knew that those two things were related, that the more we have these weather events, and I would add, the more we, that our food production is impaired by, by the threat to pollinators, um, the more you have migration, and the more you have migration, the more vulnerable people you have, and the more vulnerable people you have, the more threats you have uh, for, that those people will be trafficked. And while I was there, I talked to the mayor of Gaborone, Botswana about the situation that he was facing with all the migration um, on his continent from the weather events, from droughts mostly, and the impact that was having on his city and how he had to think about policy in his city given the migration in and out and the, and the turmoil that he was facing. And I realized something in a brand new gut level way that I, hadn't, that, I had, that I had known and that I had felt in this country, but I hadn't felt so much until I talked to one person from one city on the African continent, which was the decisions we're making here in Minneapolis, we're, just not, we're not just making them about Minneapolis. That decision to make sure that we are supporting pollinators in Minneapolis, or that decision about whether or not we use a plastic bottled water as opposed to a glass of water from the tap, that actually matters to the mayor of Gaborone, Botswana. Because that decision affects what's happening in our environment. That, ha that affects what's happening to the layer of air that, that encapsulates us and allows us to have this amazing human experience together. But when it shoots up straight up from Minneapolis, it hits that, but it doesn't stay there. Eventually it moves its way around the world and it changes how other people in the world experience that same environment because we are completely connected. We are connected by the least among us so the supposed least among us, and by the biggest thing that we can see, which is the sky. And that connects us to the mayor of Gaborone, Botswana. So I don't know, I think you'd be glad we're all here talking about pollinators, right? Because we are all connected and this matters. So science matters, climate matters. The biggest thing we can see and the smallest thing that we almost can't see, both of those things matter for our future together. So thank you for doing this work here today. Um, I will give a plug, I will give a plug that I know and we encourage individuals can make a difference here. That we can create backyard pollinators gardens such as milkweed, fennel, lupin. This is the other conversation you'd have with my mom, by the way. Um, you can provide windbreaks and nesting areas and we can educate ourselves and our neighbors about the importance of pollinators. But just know as you do that, it's not, because, it's not just because, hey, that's a good thing to do, and hey, we're a little worried that we won't be able to eat in a couple of years because <laughs> there won't be any food. Um, it's also because we care about each other. And this is one of the ways we have to show that we care about each other and we know that we're connected by the sky and by the bees. So have a great conference. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad I could share this moment with you. And thank you for your care and stewardship for our city and for our environment. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hodges. Wouldn't it be great if we had a pollinator protection resolution, resolution in every city, community, county in the country? Um, and those resolutions are available to you in a PDF form if you're curious 
Um, on our website, there's some on the table over here, Pollinator Friendly Alliance, and also on Humming for Bees website and Pollinate Minnesota's website. Um, so the Alliance works also with citizens and communities to make changes for a healthy environment because what we do for bees and pollinators is also great for air, water, land, it's all connected. We absolutely need strong leaders to help us create change. Representative Rick Hansen is one of those valued leaders. He goes far beyond the call of duty. A strong voice uh, for what's right and true, advocating for a clean environment and pollinator protections in the state of Minnesota. This man walks the talk. He raises his family on a regenerative farm in Minnesota. He has a degree in biology and soil management. He really, truly cares. He's fighting that good fight. Representative Hansen is in his seventh term at the Minnesota House of Representatives for West St. Paul, Mendota Heights, and Lilydale. Luckily for us, he's also the DFL lead on the House Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. And he has authored leading legislation on pollinator and environmental protections. Please welcome environmental champion, Representative Rick Hansen. Well, good afternoon. I'm going to talk about politics. OK? Nobody got up and left. That's, that's great. Um, I'm not sure if you've had a chance to look around the building here at the Humphrey Institute. Um, I would encourage you to do that, because uh, does anybody know what Hubert H. Humphrey's initial claim to fame was? He did, Chris, does, Chris doesn't count. It's the, it's the merger of the Farmer Labor Party and the Democratic Party in Minnesota, because individually, each party could not win. They couldn't get to a majority that building a coalition that successful politics and thus successful policy is about addition, not subtraction. It's about addition, not division. And so what Hubert Humphrey did with some of his peers was presided over that merger of the party. He built a coalition that essentially uh, provided power in this state, political power, and the political power to implement policy. Without the political power, you couldn't implement the policy. You can argue about the policy, you can try to affect the policy, but without that political power, you couldn't impl implement the policy. And so we implemented, and I'm using we here broadly, but uh, that merger party um, implemented a lot of policy that made this state what it is today. Don't leave out the part about the Vietnam War. <laughs> I want, and that was, and what happened there is you had division and you had splitting because you had differences of opinion. And when you had the division, people lost. So, Throughout history, we have this coming together and then dividing apart. Coming together, dividing apart. Um, what we can do individually, I'm going to ask, how many of you have run for a political office? How many of you have thought about running for a political office? How many of you should run for a political office? <laughs> So the, the first political office I ran for was Soil and Water Conservation District Supervisor. And that's nonpartisan, five people, great amount of power, you get to implement money to implement pra conservation practices at the local level. Um, how many of you run for that? Anybody? So you don't have to run for a partisan office. On a five-member board, how many do you need to count for? You need to count to three. <clears throat> if you're on a county commissioner board and you have seven members, how many do you need to count to? Four. And it's really great if you can count to five or you can count to seven because you get, you, you get that consensus. 
Now, sometimes when there's consensus, sometimes consensus is used to prevent moving forward, that we have to have consensus. And where I work, sometimes uh, consensus is that elusive ghost that we, we keep chasing that we can't get to. We've implement, implemented a lot of good policy in Minnesota, and we've done it through coalition building, and we've done it by having a variety of ideas that are backed up by science, and by having credible testifiers to show up, having people who are not the usual lobbyists, not the usual folks that show up and have been showing up for the past 20 or 30 years, but new faces who can come and say what they believe and what they understand and what they experience. By having those folks show up, you can build that coalition to get things passed. And often, when you get something passed that's really meaningful, there's a backlash to it. That folks who don't like what you did will try to undo what you did. But it's harder to undo something sometimes than it is to do something. If you, if you have these magical moments where you're working together, where you've built a coalition, where you have people who don't hardly agree on anything, but can agree on one thing, that's a powerful coalition. And those coalitions are out there that you can build. <clears throat> now, I know there's efforts at trying to build coalitions, and I know there's efforts at trying to build change, and right now it's very hard to get that positive change to move. So a lot of time that I'm spending right now is defensive. But you still need that coalition. You still need to use the tools that we have, which are your variety of experiences, your variety of knowledge, your variety of thought, working together to help defend on the progress we've made, but also lay a foundation for future action. Now, what's challenging in our state right now, and I think it's probably happening in your states as well, and around the country, is sometimes people just don't want to hear, or they don't want to see. They don't want to see the information. You can provide them with fact, but they have their ideology or their belief system that overrides that. And that is very frustrating when you bump up against that, uh, because you think, oh, I just wasted my time. They're not listening to me. Well, maybe they aren't, but maybe somebody else is listening to you. And when somebody else is listening to you, that could be a coalition partner. And if you have elected officials who aren't listening to, to you, there is a solution, and it's called replacing them in an election. That if my constituents don't like what I'm doing, they can replace me. Now, you may say, oh, Rick, you're in a blue district, uh, you're, you're going to, and I, I live in a red district, and it's really hard. Change happens dramatically. I was in our uh, legislative, one of our legislative committees uh, earlier this year, and in 2008, we passed a constitutional amendment to raise our sales tax for clean water, outdoor heritage, parks, and arts and history. And I asked in a member, in a, I think it was a 26-member committee, how many people on that committee were here when we voted on the constitutional amendment in 2008? Five people raised their hands out of 26. There has been that much turnover because people either got beat or they walked away, but there's constant change in our elections, and there's constant change at the soil and water level or at your town level or at your county level and at your state level, hopefully at the federal level. Um, I'm asking you to consider running for office. I'm asking you to bring your experience to running for office, even if you think it's not possible. Think, well, I don't know about me. I don't know if I can do that. That's the great thing about the American dream. You can try. And if you get people to work with you, you're trying together. And everything we're talking about in each of these plenaries and everything we're talking about with the science and everything we're listening to each other about is needed at your respective levels of government. It's needed at the city level. It's needed at the school board level. On my way here, I drove through District 197 in West St. Paul, and there was a sign 
that this lawn on this school is pollinator friendly and they're not going to spray. That was on the lawn today. And what we're doing, if we're not able to pass things at the state level, you're seeing cities that pass, like Minneapolis. Well, Minneapolis passed it in my district. South St. Paul and Mendota Heights were fighting to be first. <laughs> South St. Paul won. Uh, they got first. But then the school district went in. So you get cities, and then you have school districts, and then you have counties, county parks. And that's what led to the governor looking at state lands. So if you have governors, they have executive authority. And the governor moved forward, frankly, I think, because he saw this movement of city after city, school district after school district, county after county, all coming together and passing similar, not exactly the same, but similar things that were targeted for their communities. Those local elected officials could pass stuff. So keep doing it. We, I, and I don't know if you know this, but as legislators, we actually talk to each other in other states. Uh, we share information. We, we, so we bring, I've brought models of, uh, of the city resolutions to representatives from Utah, from Hawaii, Vermont, Maryland, Wisconsin, um, Tennessee, Florida. A number of members to help share that. And with, with our, with these, now you can share information very quickly. And so I would ask you, with your peers in your states, to share. And you may say, oh, our legislature, uh, there, there's so few allies there. But I bet you can find one. And if you can find two, then you can maybe find three, or you can make four, and you can make five, and then sooner or later you can pass things. And experiment and try things. That's what Humphrey did. They tried something new. They tried working together. And there was, there was division. You know, we don't want to... I don't know if we can really trust working with them. But there are things that you can agree on. And saving the planet, changing the way we do things, moving away from a 20th century model of nostalgia-based politics and policy, and looking at a new century model of doing things differently, we can do it. We've done it in the past, and I ask you to join with each other, not just join with me, but join with each other in making this work to implement the policies that you would like to make our states, our cities, our counties, and our country better. Thank you. So, I had the pleasure of listening to Jeff Lowenfels in the room right before lunch, and he is the Lord of the Roots. He's the longest running garden columnist in North America. He's a noted author. He has three books. I think they're all three for sale here. He's a huge proponent of organics, and without a question, the most entertaining horticultural speaker on the circuit. He's also the author, well, I'm going over the books, of two award-winning, best-selling books on organic growing, farming, and gardening. His third book, Teeming with Fungi, The Organic Gardener's Guide to Mycorrhizae, was published earlier this year. Mr. Lowenfels is a national leader in the organic gardening and sustainability movement. Please join me in welcoming Jeff. Okie dokie. How are you guys doing today? Everybody fine? Good. Hope so. Pretty serious talk so far. Hopefully mine will not be quite so serious. Let's see what we got. Um, yeah. When I first started gardening many, many years ago, I'm almost 70 years old, nobody owned their own telephone and they were all black. And when you moved away, the phone stayed in the, uh, in the house. Uh, there were lots of magazines and newspapers. There were even magazines and newspapers on gardening and farming. 
uh, there was the purple haze, the original purple haze, and if you notice what this was stolen from, uh, it's the current purple haze as well. Uh, but in any case, it was a time that had a, a phrase, it was better living through chemistry. And uh, lots of things happened. Uh, aluminum foil was invented, and we had Jiffy Pop with non-GMO corn, I might add. Um, let's see here. We had plastic invented. Uh, we ate plastic, and we ate with plastic. Uh, we played with plastic. Uh, we had new fertilizers that were developed, and they were going to just make everything so much better. Uh, we learned how to spray our food so that we wouldn't have blemishes on them. Uh, we invented instant coffee. And uh, again, we had our own television show with its own slogan, Better Living Through Chemistry, with Mr. Wizard. Some of you are old enough to remember him. He had this little dweeby assistant with him all the time, who, of course, took the slogan a little bit too far. But that's OK. Uh, many of us in my generation did. But in any case, Today, things are very different. So we don't have any aluminum foil in our, uh, in our uh, Jiffy Pop. Uh, we don't have uh, aluminum foil in our TV dinners. This is our instant coffee. We all own our own telephones and carry them around with us. And some of you are using them right this minute. Uh, our telephones all have every magazine you could ever want, including organic gardening. And uh, they contain a television set, which is even in most incredible. And when we want information, we can get it any time and any place. <laughs> now, for years and years and years, like most gardeners in the United States of America, I believed that nitrogen was nitrogen, and a plant didn't care whether the nitrogen was in a brown manure form or in a green powder form. It was nitrogen. And uh, you know, it was symbolized by miracle grow. Uh, to me, nitrogen was nitrogen, and again, it didn't matter where, what it was, it was nitrogen. Uh, and then one day, after arguing with my fellow garden writers for about 20 years that it didn't matter to a plant, somebody sent me this particular slide uh, with the words, it's the soil food web, you lose. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. It was the middle of the winter in Anchorage, Alaska. My wife was on the East Coast getting some kind of a degree someplace. And so I spent about 48 hours trying to find out what the soil food web was and what I was looking at. Now, this is a nematode. Nematodes are blind. They travel through the soil at a temperature gradient where they know they're going to run into the food that they need to eat. This particular guy was running through the soil and all of a sudden smells these wonderful, let's just say, peppermint lifesavers, and so decides to swim into those lifesavers, which is what this depicts. Now, the minute that nematode swims into those lifesavers, a funny thing happens. They fill up with water and they strangle the nematode. Those lifesavers are part of a single fungus. That's a fungal hyphae that's protecting a tomato root from this very nematode. Whoa, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Wait a minute, a nematode. First of all, a picture of a nematode electron microscope, and then a single fungal hyphae killing off a nematode? I never heard of such a thing. OK, I clearly was beginning to figure something out. Uh, and then I had to try to find out what the soil food web was, so I looked and looked and looked. And finally, I found this diagram with the name Dr. Elaine Ingham underneath it. And as America's longest garden writer, uh, columnist in the world, uh, you know, I was looking at this stuff, and I didn't know what I was looking at. I had no idea what a mycorrhizal fungi was. I had no idea what I was looking at, and I was embarrassed about it. And so I continued to do research, and I came across this very famous picture. And I could give the whole lecture off this picture. I won't. Um, but it all starts here with the plants. The plants put out exudates by using the photosynthetic energy to make them. They put out these things that drip out of the root called exudates. Now, you're sitting here exudating right now. You're sweating. And your sweat does the same thing that these exudates do. These exudates attract bacteria and uh, a fungus. And the bacteria and the fungi are attracted to the exudates because they contain tremendous amounts of carbon. And they eat the carbon, and they eat the exudates, and they have a great time. And they're right there in the root zone in the rhizosphere. They, in turn, attract the things that eat them. So nematodes and protozoa come along, and they eat the bacteria and the fungus so that they also can get carbon. And they poop out the excess right there in the rhizosphere, and that feeds the plant. So that's the soil food web. And it all starts with a plant, which spends about 50 to 60% of its photosynthetic energy in order to do this. 
Uh, and then, of course, you've got the little guys that are down there, are eaten by the bigger guys and the bigger guys and the bigger guys. A soil food web is nothing more than a bunch of soil food chains where the little guy gets eaten by the bigger guy, gets eaten by the bigger guy, and every now and then, somebody on one of those chains looks up or looks down, sees another chain, sees something they can eat off of the other chain, and does so, and connects all those chains together, so you end up with this gigantic soil food web. Well, what I'm going to give you right now is a very quick lesson on the soil food web. We've got to go underground in order to do it. And you're going to have to look at things through my weird eyes because I don't have an electron microscope. So let's pretend for a second that this is a tree outside here at the campus, the University of Minnesota. These are the roots of the tree. Let me put them upside down. And it's a Friday afternoon, and this tree is sitting there, and it's been a tough week students walking all over the soil, and it says, you know, I'm hungry tonight for something different. I'd like some Mexican, no, nah, Japanese food. And so what does it do is it mixes up the exudates, it drips those exudates out through the root system, and the next thing you know, it attracts Japanese fungi and bacteria. <laughs> now, the plant is in control. We like to think as gardeners and farmers that we're in control, but the plant's in control. So if it wanted American food, it changes the exudate and it attracts American food. And it's really easy for it to do so, because that's what plants do. 50, 60% of its photosynthetic energy is used to produce these exudates. Your exudates, incidentally, they're attracting bacteria and fungi. Those are attracting nematodes. If you disappeared right now, all of your shapes would still be here because of the nematodes that are covering your body. Hated to do that to you, but I have to do that. So American food, if it wanted French food, it could have French food, you get the point. The plant is in control. So in addition to attracting the things that it needs in order to get nutrients, it also attracts and does other things. So for example, this is a picture that was sent to me from the University of Arizona about two years ago of some exudates. Now these particular exudates turn out to be identical to your white blood cells. These are ex-DNA cells. And what they do is they go out into the soil. They're produced by the plant. They, they actually come from that area we used to call the sloughed off region, that little root tip area, you know, the root would go through. It's these things that are, they come off and they attach themselves, they cleate onto minerals that they don't, that the plant doesn't want. So arsenic tied up in the soil by these guys. Just like your white blood cells put out leukocytes and tie stuff up. So the connection is, is absolutely phenomenal. And so in addition to attracting the food that it needs, the, the plant is also trying to attract tremendous numbers and diversity of microbes because we are protected by diversity. If all of us sitting in here today, you know, were alligators, well, you know, that little chick is in big trouble. But if there were a bunch, a lot of chickens in there and just a couple of alligators, everything would be kept in control. So diversity and large populations keep things in control. Now in a teaspoon of soil, there are 500 million to a trillion bacteria and, and uh, another organism called archaea, which I didn't even have in the first edition of the book because I didn't know about them. They were discovered in 1978. I think right here at the University of Minnesota maybe even. And uh, they turn out to be the third branch of life. Uh, so there's 500 million to a trillion bacteria and archaea. They look alike. They have different cell walls. And these guys, they eat and eat and breed and breed. And what they eat are simple sugar things. They break down the ends of complex molecules. I can't show you the, the uh, breeding uh, thing because it's a mixed audience. But they, if you take two bacterium, you know, and you put them in a Petri dish and you leave them there for ideal conditions for a couple of weeks, you end up with six feet of bacteria all around the entire world. Fortunately, we don't have uh, ideal conditions. Now, these bacteria, uh, they, they break down the sugars in plants, cellulose, very easy things uh, uh, to, 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 to do. Um, and we water our plants partly to feed the microbes that are feeding the plant because they need water in order to live. And there's some really cool bacteria. The, the, uh, uh, the, these are the uh, uh, ones that produce a lot of the antibiotics, um, the, the streptocarpus, and they're up. They're in a slightly little different level, uh, and they really are beautiful and pretty. And then there's the two that we know about, rhizobia, which fix nitrogen, and one you might not know about called frankia, which is an actinomycetes, which I just showed you. Uh, and, and these are in all of the alder trees you've got around here. If you dig them up, you'll find these things. They also fix nitrogen, and we're just beginning to learn how to produce these, so we'll be using these as nitrogen fixation as well. But the thing about this for gardeners and farmers is that the bacteria produce a slime. When you get up in the morning, 
your teeth are covered with bacterial slime. And everybody's now licking their teeth as I look out at you. But that's OK. And you have to use a tremendous amount of energy to get that slime off your teeth, OK? Now, that's the same thing that happens to soil. And that slime is formed by the bacteria protecting themselves. So they, they make this slime, and they coat themselves with this slime. They stick together. It protects the colony from things getting into it. But that is sticky. And so it sticks to a particle of soil, and then another particle of soil bumps into it and sticks together. And so you start to get soil structure as a result of this bacterial slime. And the other thing about this slime is it has a pH that is above 7. Okay? It's sticky, and it has a pH above 7, so it's not an acid. It's the opposite of an acid. And uh, another thing about bacteria in the soil, there are good bacteria in the soil that do great things, and then there are bacteria that sort of hang around waiting for you not to be looking, and then they get into trouble, and they cause trouble for you. Okay, so that, that happens quite often. Keep an eye on those bacteria that are bad. We'll talk about them in a couple of minutes. In that teaspoon of soil, there's also about 14 feet of invisible fungal hyphae. Um, and so uh, they're in there, and you can't see them, but they are also in that, in that soil. Uh, it's it's, it's fun, fungus and fungi, not fungi, uh, but okay, a lot of jokes about fungus. Uh, and they have all the same parts as a plant. We never learn about these parts, but it's basically the same thing as a plant, except it doesn't have chlorophyll in it. And the cell wall is made out of chitin, which is the same stuff that's in lobsters and crabs, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, they digest by dropping out acids. Uh, and those acids then uh, digest outside of the stomach, uh, and they're in the soil digesting, and then it takes in the nutrients that it needs. Uh, they move quite fast. They grow quite fast. They're kind of really fascinating organisms. And when they grow, they form this little white spot there that you see as you move up. It's, it's growing, and that white spot gets brighter and brighter and brighter. That's called a spritzing cropper. And the spritz and cropper is sort of the command center. And it tells the, it tells the, you know, the fungus, there's some food over here on the left, or don't go over there on the right, there's somebody's going to, you know. And this stuff weaves through those bacterial stuck together particles of soil and creates more soil structure. And they're not flat bricks. They're, they're, they're irregular. And so they have these holes in them. And you get these pores. And so when it rains, the bad air is pushed out. The pores act as a reservoir, pulling in good air behind it. Uh, little guys can hide from the bigger guys. This is where soil structure comes from. Bacteria and fungus, who knew? And this fungus can grow and multiply if you take a handful of good compost and you put some baby oatmeal in it and throw it into a yogurt cup and put it in your furnace room for 48 hours. You end up with this. This I used to carry around. The TSA hates it. They used to take it out of a, I could pass it around to everybody in here, take it out of the container and pass it around, come back, it'd still be the same shape because I've activated miles and miles of fungal growth inside this little teeny thing. And the TSA used to go and sniff all those spores in their noses. And so they said, don't do this anymore. But, but these guys, they grow like crazy. They multiply like crazy. They form this incredible network called the mycelium. Uh, and they can digest all sorts of stuff because of the acids that they produce. Here's a, a fungal hyphae going into a, uh, some feldspar. And so unlike bacteria, these guys use acid. So the soil that is dominated by fungus has a pH below 7, bacteria above 7. And you've got really beautiful soil structure if you've got this fungus. And there are some very specialized fungus, just like there are specialized bacteria that create nitrogen. There are mycorrhizal fungi. And the mycorrhizal fungi, in return for some of those exudates, go out and get for the plant phosphorus, zinc, calcium, copper, magnesium, water, all sorts of nutrients that the plant can't get itself uh, without using the mycorrhizal fungi. So they're very, very important. We'll talk a little bit about them more. Um, then there are several thousand protozoa. And I all studied protozoa in high school. Nobody remembers what this is. But you took home a diagram of a, of a bottom of a shoe, and you had to put the gullet in it. This is a paramecium. And one paramecium will eat 10,000 bacteria a day and poop out the excess with all the nitrogen and goodies that's in it. This is what they look like today under an electron microscope. Uh, this is one that nobody really saw, but that we always said we did. It's an amoeba. Uh, this is what they look like under a microscope today, electron microscope. Uh, and this is one that attacks dogs. Um, 
And then in that same tablespoon of soil, there's 40 to 50 nematodes. Okay, remember, they're covering you right now. And these nematodes are all different depending on the mouth parts that they have, what they eat. And so you've got this guy on your skin, huh? Whoa, looks like a dental drill. But in fact, those are just rubber spatulas waving water which contain bacteria into the mouth. This one, on the other hand, is a little bit more serious. That little pin gets punched into uh, the cytoplasm of an organism that it wants to eat. Uh, this one is hookworm, and this one attacks dogs. Um, I got a thing about dogs, I guess. And this is what they look like when they attack your roots, and you get some diseases in your roots. And of course, there are beneficial nematodes, which you can buy now that do all sorts of things. There's one that actually heat sinks into the back of slugs, gets into the slug, lays its eggs, but brings bacteria in with it. So that the if eggs, that when they hatch, can eat the bacteria and they end up eating the whole slug. It's a great thing. But anyway, so what happens in the soil, in all good soils that's not ruined by pesticides, is you've got all sorts of bacteria and fungi being eaten by all numbers of nematodes and amoebas and protozoa, pooping out the excess and feeding the plants, okay? And the poop comes out as nitrogen which feeds the plants. Now, there are bigger things in the soil as well, obviously. They're the microarthropods and arthropods, and you can see those by making something called a burlaise funnel. And the burlaise funnel is nothing more than an inverted pop bottle with a little, a little piece of screen down there at the neck, and you throw some duff in there, uh, and then you put a little light on it. And what happens is the heat and the light causes the organisms that are in the soil to go down through the screen into the cup that you get down at the bottom. And I always tell people, if you're a little squeamish about putting your hands in the soil, don't look, because there's some pretty freaky looking things in there. Um, you can also do this by taking a handful of duff and throwing it into a bucket of water and see what floats up at the top. And what you find are all sorts of things with little nibs and nabs that bite you and do all sorts of stuff, but they really don't. Tremendous number of mites and like long thing there is a japajid. They've got all sorts of, of, of uh, little springtails and stuff. And if you know what these guys are, you can figure out what they eat, and you can tell whether your soil is dominated by bacteria or fungus, and then determine what kind of nitrogen your plants need, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But we won't go into that right now. Buy the books, you can figure that all out. But what's going on in the soil is that all these guys are running around in the soil, breeding and killing each other, and making tunnels, more poor spaces for the air to go out when the rain comes in, all sorts of hiding spaces, more soil structure, and it's an eat versus eat and kill be killed world down there with all sorts of activity going on, more soil structure, crickets getting eaten by spiders, mites eating white flies, we got the evil rove beetle, who's I think finally, finally being uh, uh, done away with, going extinct I hope, uh, and then of course we've got things like ants which are bringing organic material down into the garden and into the farm and into the soil, tremendous amounts, everything's part of the soil food web, these guys keep predators in check, they, they, you know, they take out bad guys, uh, and then there are worms, oh my golly, you know, two to three million per acre, they create these boreholes, uh, they bring down all sorts of organic matter into the, into the soil, and these burrows, they're blind, they have no hands, and yet they know that if you take a leaf, it's like an umbrella, you can't pull an umbrella into a hole when it's open, but if you turn it the other way around, it'll go down into the hole. And these blind, no-handed critters know to flip the leaf over so that they can get it into the ground. Unbelievable. And the reason why I talk about these is because these are not native to the United States anymore. When they poop, their stuff contains high concentrations of the nutrients that are in the soil or whatever they're, they're living off of. And you can read as well as I can. I was explaining today uh, that in Anchorage, Alaska, we finally got worms in Anchorage, Alaska, about 25 years ago. And I would get, I still get calls from people saying, what are these things in my lawn? How do I get rid of them? And I have to explain to them what they are. It's hard to believe when you live in Minnesota, you've had worms all your life. And then there are things like the, beetle, the beetles, I'm sorry, dung beetles. Uh, and they're phenomenal. They do incredible things. They're very, very important. I have a friend in Oregon who has a dung beetle ranch. He sells them around the world. Uh, dung beetles are revered in most places, not so much in America. Um, they've discovered how they travel. They use the, uh, the sun. They actually have one that, that travels at night, and they've determined exactly how it moves using the Milky Way as it's the... Can you imagine, in Donald Trump's world, <laughs> applying uh, for the unit, that, uh, you know, the experiment to allow you to put sunglasses on a dung beetle? But anyway, they're phenomenal. What happens is they hop on the pile, but they bring with them these little red things. Those are mites. 
And the big dung beetle competition are fly larvae. And so they bring these mites with them, they hop into the dung, the mites get off and take out the fly larvae. And then when they're ready to leave, they got this nice beautiful ball which they're gonna roll using the Milky Way, they blow the whistle, the mites get back on, and the, away they go. Now, they didn't have dung beetles in Australia when they brought the convicts down there, and they had poop every, this is what it looked like, it was poop everywhere, and si finally somebody had to go uh, you know, to Africa to find the right dung beetles so that they could clean up, and you know, so this is what Australia looks like today. Uh, anyway, everything is part of the soil food web. Everything is part of the soil food A bird flies around with a worm in its mouth, you know, and it sees, a, it sees another bird and it drops the worm as it's talking to the other bird. It's got protozoa on its body. When it touches the ground, its feet are covered with prior, it just ugh, filthy little animals and they spread stuff all over the place uh, and they're all part of the soil food web. Everything's part of the soil food web and of course, even man, uh, but we know what bears do in the woods. They're part of the soil food web. This is my window in Anchorage, Alaska. If you look carefully at that white couch, you'll see a little crease where my head was a nanosecond before my wife, my <laughs> wife took this picture because the window is open. That's an open window. There's just a little screen there. And, and, and uh, you know, it was sitting there. I was thinking, no porno. What? Why am I hearing this heavy breathing? And I looked around, there it was. But you never know what you're going to see out of a window in Anchorage, Alaska. You know, you might see a moose. We know moose poop in the woods, and it's all part of the soil food web. One time, I even saw a pair of palins. <laughs> I give the whole talk just for that one little joke. But, all right, so obviously we're part of the soil food web as well. And we're a bad part of the soil food web, part of which is because we use you know, things like miracle Grow. Now, I don't want to bad, yeah, I do. I want to bad mouth miracle Grow, but I'll be careful doing so. The stuff works. I mean, and it works really well. And the reason why it works is because it's so heavily concentrated, just a teeny little bit of it needs to touch the root. Of course, the rest of it goes down into the water system and down the Mississippi Delta, and you see that big, beautiful, you know, colorful dead zone down there outside New Orleans. Farmers use one quarter less. No, let me put it this way. Gardeners use four times more nitrogen per acre than farmers do, so gardeners have... So the problem with all of this stuff is, you know, a lot of these uh, pesticides and certainly the fertilizers, they're salts. And we all learned in high school what happens when you put salt on a single cell organism. What happens is the single cell organism water goes out to dilute the salt. The salt, uh, you know, goes into the single cell organism to dilute the water and you end up with a pretty near equilibrium. There's actually one or two molecules difference always. But you get an equilibrium and you get a dead cell because you blow it all up, uh, you know, and it's, and it's a bad thing. So instead of having the nematode, you know, getting strangled by the single fungal hyphae, the fungal hyphae's dead and the nematode gets into the tomato plant. And that's not all because once these things start happening, once you start feeding your plant and once you start using pesticides in order to take care of bad things, the plant says, what the hell? I don't need to do very much. Someone else is doing it for me. I don't need to spend that 50% of my energy to produce extra dates. And so you don't end up with nitrogen fixation. You don't end up with a mycorrhizal partnership. So you don't end up with all the nutrients that these guys are bringing them. It's a bad, bad thing. And as I explained earlier, the mycorrhizal fungi are where the soil carbon basically comes from. So if you don't have them, you're not adding carbon to your soil. Things get bad, you get dependency, you get disease, you get bad problems. And of course, this is not the only stuff that we do to, to, to you know, we rototill. You know, when you cut a worm in half, rototilling, you don't get two worms. You get two halves of a dead worm unless you hit it at the 18th segment, in which case, Half of it lives, but not very well. Um, and so we rototill our soil, we break it up like crazy, whether it's farming or, you know, we just, we love to do it. And the bacteria that are supposed to be here, they're up here, and the fungi is completely gone. That mycorrhizal network that's connecting all your soil structs, gone. And then the first thing that happens is it rains and the air gets pushed out of the soil. So you start to lose oxygen from the soil. And the next thing you know, you get anaerobic pockets in your soil. And if there's one thing I know, is that anaerobes produce alcohol, and I love alcohol, so, but I don't love it in my soil. And so one part per alcohol that touches a root kills the cells of the root. So you start to get death, and you know, that little bad guy that was hanging out there, you know, starts to come in and do its thing, and the next thing you know, maybe not right away, but you wake up one morning, you have a bad case of toilet paper flipperopherous. What the hell do you do when you have this? You didn't know where it came from, so you go to Lowe's and you ask the genius there with a great high school education, what do I use? 
he doesn't know, so he goes and asks his supervisor. You know, she has a college degree. She has no idea either. So you just use your nose and you find the area in the store that sells the stuff because you can smell it with your eyes closed. You buy it. You read the label and you spray. No, you don't read the label because you have to take a razor blade and open it up. And if you're my age, you got to get your bifocals out in order to be able to read the damn stuff. But anyway, you go out and you spray and of course, you end up spraying everything, not just the bad guy. And so you compound the problems that you created in the first place by using the chemicals and the fertilizers because you killed off the bottom of the soil food web. Those bacteria and those fungi, the nematodes and the protozoa. And it becomes a slippery slope and it gets worse and worse and worse. And you know, finally you get to the point where even the animals are on their hands and knees praying that you will stop using chemicals so that they can live properly. All right, I gotta do it, I'm sorry. I hope I'm not offending anybody, but these are three Muslims I came upon. <laughs> ah, terrible joke. Okay, anyway, uh, so what do you do? You got two choices. The first is you can fake it. You can go out and you can get a pesticide and you can spray and you can feed your plants. That's faking it. Or you can do the obvious thing, ski only in the winter. Of course you only ski in the winter. You can do the obvious thing, which is to put the microbes back into the system again. And it's very easy to do, and you can do it by using compost. You can use compost teas made out of your compost. You can use mulches, and you can add mycorrhizal fungi. Those things will put the microbes back. They're easy to do. You don't need an education to be able to do it. They're relatively cheap, almost usually even free. So everybody needs to do it. Now what I've just explained to you is how you explain the soil food web. Thank you very much. Am I supposed to take questions? No. Hey, one other thing I'd like to just say, can we give a big round of applause for Carla and her, her crew? Because you, you don't know how much effort they put into checking the slideshows, making sure that the, we all spoke together on the phone, et cetera, et cetera. These things look like they're easy to put together, but that's only because we've got a bunch of experts doing it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, we are now going to give a uh, Dragonfly Award to somebody who's been very effective in Minnesota, helped us with this conference and reaching out to various people. So I want to ask Lori Schneider to come up here. <laughs> We've had Pat on your tail to make sure that you didn't leave the building. Yeah. <laughs> so, Lori, I only recently met you, but I know of all your work in Stillwater and um, phenomenal stuff. Uh, you're an award-winning photographer by day and a pesticide activist by night and part of your days, right? So, our Dragonfly Award says, in honor and appreciation of Lori Schneider, for, envis for envisioning and advocating for a community that values the environment, and lives in harmony with pollinators. That's us. Yeah. Wrap, wrap, wrap. So, we need somebody to take a picture. Oh yeah. Not this me. is our. This is our. Uh, <laughs> you're not going to take the picture. <laughs> not this time. Okay. Totally not expected. You yeah, I know. We try to. We try to surprise folks. Anybody? They're going to fall off. And Somebody's going to get damaged. Let me, right. let me, let's see, you're in the middle, right? I'm in the middle, let's okay. see. That's a video, everybody. Yeah, one more. <laughs> it's a video? You just hit the middle of the screen. <laughs> All right, that'll work. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you,
Okay, what would you all like to do? The uh, panel starting in um, 15 minutes on alternatives in the back here in the in the main room. Would you like to ask Jeff some more questions? Is or anybody else? Yes. No. So why don't y'all just talk amongst yourself and we'll. Oh, you had a question. Why don't you stand? Yeah. Earlier today, I mentioned that there was a question about collaborating and find networking within the state, and you had a question that, yeah. why don't you just talk yeah, to sure. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. I'm Richard Labor. I'm from Bloomington, Minnesota. It's a difficult act to follow with these uh, marvelous, uh, valuable presentations and information. Uh, the reason I'm here, I spoke with Jack, uh, Jay Feldman about this, is uh, I think there are many that feel so energized and activated here that you want to find out what to do with all this information. And I think um, people should stand up from states, for instance, where they want to coordinate with other people in their state or from communities in Minnesota and connect with them and find out what they can do together. Uh, I, for one, would like to see, to start off, uh, how many are here from Bloomington, Minnesota? If you would stand up. Nobody. I can't connect with anybody. Would anybody else want to stand up, to want to identify where they are from, and so they can connect with others, and please have, have others stand up to connect with these people, either from another state or from another community in Minnesota? Yes. Join hands for pollinators next weekend. Join hands for pollinators. Do you want to take over from it? I know there's a lot of networking going on among the groups, especially the co-sponsor groups that are associated with the conference. And we can circulate the list of those groups and addresses that you can reach out to. Uh, if anybody else wants to stand up and then mention who you are, that, uh, what, what is your name, sorry? Richard. Richard can connect with, or others, you're welcome to do that now, if you'd like. Or, you know, if you're here through dinner, we'll have another opportunity to do that. So the microphone's open, but um, we should start moving to the session on the alternatives panel, which is going to be really exciting. Credible speakers that are actually working on a really cutting edge alternative practices for land management uh, and invasive uh, uh, weed management. Thanks, thanks everybody. See you now.